All right, welcome 241 guys. Uh, we've got um, a lot ahead of us in this course, and I thought one of the things I wanted to do was try to make more of these little YouTube videos. I think some of you um, find them helpful, so I'm going to try to carve out some time every so often to do these little tutorials in addition to the answer keys that I typically do, and I hope that's helpful. If uh, you have feedback or if they're, they're helpful, let me know. If they're not and I need to change things up, let me know. I'm here to help so uh, we can talk about that in class. But now I want to dive right in and think about um, how do we approach these transition metal coordination compounds? What are they made of? Uh, what do they kind of look like? Well, how, do, how does the bonding uh, take place? And probably most importantly, how do we name them? Because I think for many of you starting out with this course, if you've not seen this before, uh, naming can be pretty daunting at the beginning. It almost sounds like we're speaking a different language and uh, it can be really confusing. And so what I want to do is make this tutorial. Hopefully uh, you can go back and watch it, um, you know, fast forward or skip to the parts that are helpful. Um, and, and really, I think just the only thing I can tell you do a bunch of examples because the more experience you build, the more comfortable you're going to be and the lower your stress is going to be and you're going to be confident and you're going to be ready for that exam and so you're just going to have a better feeling about everything in the course. So let's go ahead and jump right in. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we talked about it in class, but I thought, you know, um, the idea of, of transition metal chemistry I like to think of is really simple acid-base chemistry. And, and, and what do I mean by that? I mean, you've got to go back to the, the Lewis definition. And so if we think about, uh, you have metals and you have ligands, right? And, and the metals we've talked a lot about in terms of periodic trends and the transition metals versus the main group metals and all of that. But when we get into transition metal compounds, we're going to really talk about ligands and how they bind to metals. And so we need to know some vocabulary. And so Relating it back to the acid-base concept, ligands are going to be what binds to the metal, and those are going to be our Lewis bases, right? And that's really important that you go back to your uh, older definitions, right? And you think about a Lewis base, well, that is simply nothing more than an electron pair um, donor, right? And so an electron pair donor, we talked about that before, that's a, that's a Lewis uh, base. And let me give you a good example here. So if I draw something like good old ammonia, I'm going to draw a really simple... Uh, Lewis structure here, um, and then we got our lone pair. There we go. And that lone pair is available for donation, and so that makes ammonia a really good uh, Lewis base in terms of um, you know thinking about uh, the concept of Lewis bases, but also thinking about how Lewis bases can become uh, ligands. And so I could draw another one, right? I could draw water over here, and we did this in class, right? We said, okay, we'll look at water, and water's got uh, two lone pairs, right? And so in this case, we'll just pick one, and that can donate. And we can look at something, I don't know, like, um, you know, let's look at methane, right? We talked about methane in a previous uh, course. And so you look at methane, and, you know, there are no lone pairs here. So methane is, for all intents and purposes, not going to be considered a Lewis base, so it can't be a ligand. So when you're thinking about things that can be ligands, you want to find things that have lone pairs. And Again, I'm going to really harp on things like this. You've got to go back to you know, the previous course, and if you can't draw Lewis structures, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So go back and you know, spend a little time thinking about that. And, and these Lewis bases are going to interact with metals, and the metals are going to be our Lewis acids, and they're going to be uh, the things that are going to be electron pair. They're not donors, they're acceptors, right? And that's really important. And so they're going to be electron deficient. So if you think about things like Oh, I don't know, copper 2 plus, uh, nickel 2 plus, uh, cobalt 3 plus, uh, platinum 2 plus. Uh, you can even think about things that are crazy like uh, manganese uh, 7 plus. These are really reactive things. But, you know, the idea here, these are all cations. They're very electron deficient. They would like to have some electron density. They're really good Lewis acids. And so they're going to interact with that Lewis base. And so if we think about something like ammonia, right, if we draw ammonia, and I'll just draw the formula here to save time, and I'll stick that lone pair on there. And then we have something like a cobalt, right, cobalt 3 plus. This is, again, really, this, this the cobalt guy is, is really electron deficient. It's going to crave some of that electron density from that Lewis base. So you have your Lewis base, right, our ligand, and our Lewis acid, the metal. And you're going to form a coordinate covalent bond. And what that means is you're forming a, a shared electron bond, right? So when we draw a line, it's going to be the sharing of two electrons. And those electrons are 
donated from the ammonia and that becomes a ligand and so here we have um, a nice Lewis base Lewis acid interaction and if you can really get an idea of what we're talking about here this applies to any any metal complex that we talk about later on no matter how complicated it gets it goes back to this fundamental idea and I hope this is something you hold on to as we move on and so if we're gonna bind these ligands to metals we wanna really focus on the ligands that are bound directly to a metal and so that's what's going to make up our transition metal complex and and just like in previous courses vocabulary is really important here so if we look at this compound we talked about this compound before right this is the common name is uh, cisplatin right we talked about this before one of those early chemotherapy agents but they still use uh, derivatives of it today we're, we're going to always draw that metal first and I always want to identify the oxidation state. So if you look at chlorides, right, if you think about chlorides, and don't worry, we'll get to the correct way to name these in a minute, but chloride in your previous experience is always a negative one charge, or at least most of the time it's a negative one charge, and we have two of those, so that equals a negative two, right? So negative two um, in, in total. And amine, right, ammonia, if you have that by itself, well, that's a neutral molecule. There's no charge here. And if you look at this whole thing, there's no charge, so we're going to say that's an implied zero. So that means this platinum has to be a cation, and it's going to balance out the negative ligands. And so if that's the case, this platinum, therefore, has to be a 2 plus to balance out the two chlorides, right? So we can draw that. We can draw that here. We can say we're going to form a bond to uh, one of the lone pairs in the chloride here. And we're going to, don't worry, we'll get to the actual naming in a minute. I know it's called chloro, don't worry. And then um, here we're also going to have our amine, right? And again, it's really important to, to show the atom that is the Lewis base atom, right? Because the hydrogens don't bond to the metal, the nitrogen does. And so this is really important. If you want to, it's good to get into habit and maybe draw in a bracket to show that these four ligands are directly bound. That, that means they have a covalent, coordinate covalent bond with the metal center. And I always like to draw or indicate the oxidation state of the metal because it's really important. And then each of those chloro ligands or chlorides here are going to be negative one and they're going to all balance out. So once again, we have a, a, a neutral uh, metal complex here. Now, complexes don't always have to be neutral. You can have cationic complexes and so here you see that in this case again once again the ammonia or the amine is, is is zero charge even though there's six six times zero is zero so that means all the charge of this complex comes from the cobalt which means then that the cobalt itself is a three plus really easy uh, my pen's acting up so I apologize I'll work on that but anyway so here we have six things and so six things are typically going to be uh, an octahedral. We talked about the octahedral geometry earlier in a previous course, 211 for many of you. And I'm going to draw this like that. I'm going to have four in the plane of the paper, one going behind, one going, I'm oh, sorry, one going behind, one coming in front. And I'm just going to draw the ligands like so. It gets a little messy with my pen. Um, hope I don't have to buy a new pen. This is getting kind of embarrassing here so I apologize okay but if you're playing at home you get the idea we put a bracket around the whole thing that 3 plus charge where does that come from well that comes from that cobalt having a 3 plus charge all the ligands are neutral so boom you're done there so here you see an example of a metal complex where you have six ligands bound directly to that cobalt and the sum total is actually not neutral as in the previous case but this whole thing has a positive charge Likewise, you can have you know metal complexes that have a negative charge. So here you have what you have four chlorides or four chloro ligands, which we'll talk about in a minute. So four times negative one is negative four. If the whole charge for this thing is negative two, that means this cobalt is actually a two plus. Kind of neat, right? Because cobalts can have different charges. And so here we'll actually draw, and I'll cheat and I'll tell you that this guy is probably actually going to be a, a tetrahedron. So we'll we'll draw a tetrahedron just to remind us of what a different geometry looks like and here we'll draw the chloro or the chloride if we want to call it for now don't worry we'll get to the name in a second I promise um, there we go lots of lone pairs and our last one here 
And again, we put a bracket over the whole thing, indicate that is the complex. Overall, it has a two negative charge, but that's because you have four anionic ligands and a two plus for the cobalt. And there you go. So now you see the three flavors, which will become really important later. You can have metal complexes that are neutral, cationic, positive charge, anionic, negative charge, and those are really the three types of options you'll see. Now, the, the key thing I want you to remember here is that all three of these show you a complex, and a complex is defined as, quite literally, just the ligands, the Lewis bases that are directly bound to the metals themselves. There you go. If you can remember that, you'll be in good shape. All right, we come down here, and now we want to think about the fact that complexes often, unless they're neutral, don't exist by themselves, because if you look at this guy here, this is fine. This one can be fine. You can go buy a bottle of that. It'd be an expensive bottle, but you could buy a bottle of that, and it'd be a little uh, probably yellow or orange solid, and, and it's going to have a neutral uh, charge, and so you can actually have that as a thing, right? But if you come over here, and you might recall up above, this complex was a 3+. plus. So if you're going to find this in a bottle or buy it or, or come across it in the chemistry stock room, it has to be neutralized. And by neutralized, I mean if you have this cation, right, you have to have negative charges to balance it out. The whole thing as a compound, that's where we're going to go from just the complex, right? So this part right here with the brackets is known as the complex, which we just talked about up above. And so um, we have to be careful to realize the complex, if it has a net charge, we have to balance that charge. And the way we do that is with a counter ion. And so this is really no different than something like an ionic compound that you've seen before. So if you had something like aluminum, right, or um, calcium, you have to balance that with multiple uh, anions. So if you have you know, calcium chloride, you would have calcium and two chlorides because you have a two plus calcium and, and two chlorides. But in this case, this complex has the ligands directly bound to the metal, and these extra counter ions, they are not, repeat, not bound to the metal directly. They are only there to surround it and to essentially even out the charge. So you can have a salt. Same thing here. If you look over here, we have the complex, right? The complex here. So this complex is actually an anion, right? We looked at it up here above. And so it cannot exist by itself. It has to be balanced out by a counter ion. And the counter ion here is a potassium, because if this is a two minus you know, complex ion, if you want to call it that, that's fine, you're going to need two potassiums to balance that out. So it's no different than something like if you had sulfate, right? Sulfate or phosphate, you're going to need multiple uh, one pluses to balance that out because if you had something like potassium sulfate right that'd be K2SO4 and if you think about it, this complex here it's sure it's got a transition metal but it's really no different than a polyatomic ion that you've seen before um, it's really not more complicated than that so again you have a complex right up here that is the ligands bound directly to the metal and then when you form a coordination compound if that complex is not neutral then you've got to find a counter ion to balance it out to form a neutral compound so I hope that's helpful. That's a lot of review. Uh, and then finally, the coordination number is just the number of, essentially the number of ligand uh, metal bonds that you have. And so if we go up here, you know, you could say, okay, well, what's the coordination number of this complex? Well, you'd have one, two, three, four ligand bonds to the platinum. Over here, you would have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? These are the ones in the complex. These counter ions don't count. So this would be coordination number six. And then finally, this one up here, again, only looking at the complex, you have four ligands, so that would be coordination number four. Pretty simple. Okay. Now, this is where I think some of you um, get really kind of confused and really worried, and, and that's okay, but, you know, there are very, like I always tell you, I want to try to break it down into a small set of rules that you can apply to a variety of different things. Now, granted, in this case, I am going to ask you to memorize some ligands because it's like speaking another language. You've got to know some basic vocabulary. And so even then, we can kind of look for trends to make our life a little bit easier. And so one of the trends I want you to look for is that when you take anions, like I was up above talking about chloride and chloro and kind of bouncing back and forth being wishy-washy because we hadn't gotten to this part yet. But let's just look at chloride. When you have chloride, right, and to be honest, we're going to have what our little lone pairs all around that chloride, right? And so when you form a bond with a chloride as a ligand, you take that IDE ending and you're going to convert that to an O to become the ligand name. 
So in this case, you're going to have when things end in I, D, E, they become O and their ligand name. And so let's look at some examples here, like bromide becomes bromo, chloride becomes chloro, cyanide, that's a neat one because it's not just monoatomic. You've got two um, atoms in here, and that's a cyano, fluoride back to a halogen, fluoro. Um, let's see what else we got. Hydroxide becomes hydroxo. So you can see pretty much for, uh, I mean, almost half these tables, you can take anything with an IDE and just turn it into an O, and now you know the ligand name. So there's really not a whole lot of memory work that goes into this. The other rule that you want to look for is things that have an ATE, right? So things that have an ATE ending, their ligand name becomes ATO. So from carbonate, you become carbonato. From glycinate, you become glycinato. Oxalate becomes oxalato. Thiocyanate's kind of a fun one because it's the first example of an ambidentate ligand, right? So this is ambidentate, right? Ambidentate. Um, so what happens here is that it's kind of like being ambidextrous, right? You have two uh, atoms that have lone pairs on them, and the ligand can bind through either way. If it binds through the sulfur, it's going to be called thiocyanato because it comes from thiocyanate, becomes auto, right? And if it binds through the nitrogen, uh, we're going to call that isothiocyanato because it's the isomer of uh, iso or the thiocyanato ligand. And so we just changed the name there, no big deal. Uh, we'll talk more about this later on when we talk about isomers because it's going to be really important. But really what I've just done is shown you that part down there. Okay, and then uh, there are a couple of them that are maybe a little bit odd, like ammonia we saw above. It's such a common one. Um, ammonia just becomes amine, and it has two Ms, so try to remember that when you're looking at your spelling, and that's to differentiate it from things that sound or are spelled really close to it. Water is just, um, we call that an aqua for various re obvious reasons, I hope. Uh, carbon monoxide becomes carbonyl, and ethylene diamine, which is a really cool ligand, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you often see as the abbreviation EN. Um, glycinato you see as GL. Y, and then I don't know why they didn't put this on the chart, but OX is what we call, uh, what we have the abbreviation for oxalato. So these ligand names, again, these are the only ones you have to know for the exam. There's lots more. There's so many more that you'll come across in your books and in the lab, and you'll just add those to your, your sort of collection. If you want to make flashcards, that's fine, but I don't, I think if you know these two rules and know a couple of these special ones, you're really off to the races. And so we can look down here and you can get a, a feeling for the actual Lewis structures of these dentate, uh, monodentate ligands. Again, these are monodentate because they're typically going to bind in one place to the metal. So we have the ones that we've seen before, right? Uh, here's cyanide. If you've not seen that before, that's kind of cool. This becomes that cyano. Uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, this is one that you may not know about. Um, it's really dangerous for things like carbon monoxide poisoning, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Or actually, not in a minute, in, in another day uh, for a different lecture, but it binds through the carbon, which is pretty neat, because you think about it, it could theoretically bind through either, but it, uh, for reasons we're talking about later on, does bind uh, predominantly, well, almost exclusively through the carbon. And then here's the thiocyanate one, where you can bind through the sulfur or the nitrogen. And then finally, uh, the hydroxide or hydroxo uh, ligand, which binds through the oxygen as well. And again, I, I point these out because I really want you to be careful and think about the actual Lewis structures involved here. Um, it would not be unfair of me to ask you to draw a Lewis structure for any of these because you've done this before in courses like 111. So if you go beyond the monodentate ligands, you can go on to the bidentate or the polydentate ligands where you get things like ethylene diamine, where you see here you have uh, two nitrogens, right, that can bond. So you can actually get really cool stuff like uh, this metal being bound twice uh, from one ligand. Same thing with glycinate, right, and then oxalate or the oxalato. You made, you made an iron oxalate compound in, in lab, so that's pretty cool. You can end up having uh, this guy bind like this, where one lone pair from each of the oxygens will bind to the metal, and, and that's really quite quite cool, I think. So we'll talk more about those later. And then you can get things like 
I don't know if you're interested in pre-health type stuff, if you are excited to do this, go look up this, EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. This is actually a single ligand that can be, believe it or not, it can be hexadentate. It can be a single ligand that can bind in six places. So it can form an octahedral by itself around a metal. And EDTA is really good for what's called chelation therapy. If you want to remove heavy metals from a biological system, you can use EDTA to just grab that metal and it can be passed out in the urine stream, which is really quite impressive. So anyway, I, I digress. I don't want to make this video too long, but uh, there's so much exciting things to talk about with transition metals. I really enjoy them. Okay, so you read the book, hopefully, um, and, and you read, you know, if you've read other of the supplemental texts that I put online, you can, you can find whatever works for you. And again, the, the, naming, the, the naming conventions are, are kind of um, finicky in terms of the way you look at the rules or some, some procedures will have, you know, eight steps or six steps. I, I've done my best to, to break it down for you into just four. And so I hope that if you approach it with this, these three to four, or these four steps, um, you can really tackle anything that you would see in this course. And it really goes uh, pretty simply. And, and again, I can't stress enough that if you just do uh, more and more examples, uh, the more and more confident you're gonna feel about uh, this process. And so again, what you're gonna do for step one is you gotta identify the complex, and this is where vocabulary is really important, right? That's the, the thing in the brackets, right? That's gonna be um, essentially uh, the ligands bound directly to the metal, right? If you find that, you're off to the races. Then you're gonna make a list, step two, of all the ligands in alphabetical order. And after you've done that, now you're gonna apply the Greek prefixes, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, to indicate the total number of each type. Really simple. Now note that the prefix comes after you put them alpha in an alphabetical order. You don't, you don't use the prefixes to alphabetize. That's really important. The only thing that's gonna be weird, and I promise you we'll do some examples, is that if you have a polydentate ligand, you use different prefixes, and I'll tell you why that is. One of the reasons is you wanna avoid confusion. So for example, the, the ligand ethylene diamine Ethylene diamine has a prefix in its name, so you don't want to be using prefixes that are already in the name, so we use these extra kind of um, supplemental prefixes. And so if you had two ethylene diamines, you wouldn't say diethylene diamine. That just sounds weird. You say bis ethylene diamine. And I know you're saying it's gonna, it sounds, sounds weird too, but um, it, it really helps avoid some confusion once you get into it. And then finally, back we broke these complexes into three different categories, neutral, cationic, and anionic. So if they're neutral or cationic, you're gonna reuse the first rule, number three. If they're anionic, you're gonna use the second rule, number three. And then finally, if there is a cationic or anionic complex, you have to name the counter ion to finish it all up, and it's really easy. And again, you don't use prefixes for the counter ions. Really simple. So let's just look at a couple of examples. We looked at these kind of up above too. Okay, so here I have my my platinum, right? And so this is a platinum complex, and you notice that you don't really have to do anything because it's already given to you the whole thing, right, is the complex. So you're good. So the next thing you do is you make a list, and this is called amine, so you would make amine and chloro your list, and amine starts with an A, chloro starts with a C, so amine comes before chloro. There are two of each type, so you use di, for each ligand, so you have diamine, dichloro, and then the next rule is, since this is a neutral compound, you just put the name of the metal, platinum, and its oxidation state in the Roman numerals in a parenthetical, really simple. Now things get a little bit more complicated when you start thinking about things that are gonna be cationic or anionic, because first of all, you have to find the complex, right? And the complex is always gonna be in brackets, that's really important. And then you're gonna say, okay, uh, I'm gonna ignore the counter ion for right now, that's step four. I'm gonna focus on the complex. And so now you're gonna say I have uh, aqua, right? That's one of my ligand types. And I'm gonna have chloro. And here I'm gonna say aqua comes before chloro because of alpha, you know, the alphabet, obviously. And I have four aquas. So now I'm gonna add my uh, prefix to tell me how many. And I'm gonna have two chloro, so I'm gonna use di. And so there we go, I've got my 
ligands in alphabetic order with the correct prefixes. And now since this is a cation, I'm going to use the first rule number three. And I'm just going to write the metal name. I'm just going to write chromium. And just so you all know, chromium has an H in it. So please don't spell it without the H, one of my pet peeves. But it's OK. I'm not going to take off for spelling. But there is an H in chromium. And then you're going to tell me the oxidation state. And one thing I forgot to do over here is, what is the oxidation state? Well, I need to know the charge of the complex. Well, if I know that this counter ion is a negative 1, this whole complex has to be a positive 1 to balance it out. We know that you have 2 times negative one on the chloros, right? So that means if aqua, which water is neutral, I now have to have what? That has to be a three plus so that it overtakes the negatives to become a one plus for the whole thing, which gets balanced out by the chloro, or sorry, the chloride counter ion over here. So you put the um, oxidation state of the metal in the parenthetical in the Roman numeral, and then you're almost done. Rule number four, now you worry about the counter ion, and you just name it, you just say chloride, you're done. So the hard part's getting the metal complex named. And the last one is probably the toughest. Uh, getting to name anionic complexes is just something you're gonna have to kind of struggle with. So potassium is a counter ion, it's not part of the complex, how do I know? Because it's not in the brackets, really important. This time I'm going to be a little bit more careful. I've got six times negative one, right? Because cyanide or cyanoligand is negative one charge. So, wow, that's going to be uh, a lot of negative charge. And I know that I have three potassium, so this whole complex is a negative three. So that means in order to go from negative six to negative three, that iron has to be a three plus. And so what I'm going to do now is there's only one ligand, so I can just write cyano. There are six of them, so I'm going to use hex. So hexacyano. Now, here's where you would be tempted to probably just say iron three, but you'd be wrong because this is an anionic complex. This is the only time we use the second rule number three, and you write basically the metal um, with ATE added to the end. So, for example, if it were uh, platinum, you would call it what? You call it not platinum, but you call it platinate. If it were nickel, right you would call it nicolate now this one gets a little bit tricky because if you look at fe you might be tempted to say ironate but that's not correct um, iron and gold are pretty much the only ones you're going to come across in my class where you really got to think about the, the the latin root and so fe is short for ferrum you're going to call it ferrate if you came across gold uh, which is oral uh, or eight, right? Uh, you would have to know that one as well. So again, we can talk more about the the derivation of the names from their classical roots later on. But um, yeah, um, or eight and and fair eight are probably the only ones you're going to come across in this class. So if you want to talk more about the cool uh, classical nature of, of a lot of the origins of this, we can talk about it in class or in my office. Okay. So armed with those examples, let's let's head off and, and do some more challenging ones. Okay, so at this point you can either stop the video and work ahead and try some of these on your own and, and check your answers, or you, if you're if you're still not sure, uh, you know I know this video is getting a little long. You can you can either take a break or or, or follow along with me and, and and get some extra practice. Okay, so here's one that I put in to show you. This is an octahedral complex, and if you look at it, this is cationic, right? So the complex again is in brackets. So you have six amine ligands bound to a nickel. And the amine ligands are neutral, so that means that in order for this complex to be 2 plus, that 2 plus charge has to come from the nickel metal center. And then these bromides are the counter ions. So, first, I want to focus on the complex. And the only um, ligand I have is amine, so I can write that out. So, amine. And remember, amine has two M's. Now, how many of these do I have? I've got six, right? So, so hexamine. Um, again, this is a, a complex that is cationic, so I can just write the metal name, so nickel, right? And what is the charge of that nickel? It is a 2 plus, and that is the correct name of the complex. But now I do need to be mindful of the counter ion for step 4, and I will put uh, bromide. And again, you do not repeat, do not use prefixes for the counter ions, right? That's really important. So this would be hexamine, nickel, 2 plus uh, bromine. Pretty simple. 
Okay, so if we don't have the structural formula, we can just do it from the name, right? And so again, I always will urge you to circle the complex. We know that this complex is a two minus because of the potassium counter ion. There are two of those. So right, this guy is gonna be two times positive one, right? So that's positive two. So we need to balance that with a two minus, which means if the chloral ligand is four times negative one, that means that this nickel is gonna be a two plus to balance all that out, okay? So let's go ahead and tackle the, the complex part. So uh, luckily, right, chloro is our only ligand and there are four of those. So now we're gonna put tetra, tetrachloro, and this is anionic, right? So this is where we use the second rule number three and we're gonna call this uh, nickel eight, right? Eight because it's an anion, that's really important. And the oxidation state again is two. And in this case, our counter ion is actually um, in the front so we're gonna call this potassium. So potassium tetrachloronicolate two, pretty simple. All right, let's go to some more challenging ones, at least in my opinion, I think they're more challenging. So if we look at this next one, wow, there's a lot going on in this <laughs> example, and I think it's a good one. So if you're not sure about things, this is a good example to try some harder ones. So um, here I'm gonna say, okay, what do we got? We got, this is sulfate, right? And that's a counter ion, that's a negative one, which means that this complex, right, is gonna be a positive two. Um, maybe you can't see that, let me move. Uh, the screen down a little bit. There we go, that's better. Okay, so what do we have here? We got a bunch of different stuff. Um, the first thing I see is we've got aqua, which are neutral, and oxalate, right? Oxalato, that's a negative two. Okay, we gotta be careful about that. So we know this whole thing has to be positive two. If oxalate or oxalato is uh, negative two, that means that platinum, wow, that platinum's gotta be a four plus, right? Or else we're, there's no way we can reach a, a positive two to be balanced out by the sulfate. And what are the two ligands? We've got aqua, okay, so uh, let's write the ligand names out. Aqua, all right, we've got aqua there. And how many do we have? We've got two. So that's gonna be di-aqua, right? And of course, oxalate comes after aqua, and we only have one of those, so we could say oxalato. Now, this is something that you'll see in books, and I'm just gonna address it now so you don't get freaked out about it. For polydentate ligands, Sometimes people just like to put them in uh, parentheticals, and that's fine. If you don't want to do that, I'm not going to worry too much about that. So, oh no, my screen moved over. Um, if that freaks you out, it's it's okay. Uh, don't let that be a huge, huge burden on you if that's bothering you. But I sometimes will do that, and I get in the habit of doing that. So just bear with me if I put parentheticals around polydentate ligands. I'll show you why I do that in a minute. Um, there's only one oxalate, so we don't worry, we don't ever use mono, so just leave it as is. And then, in this case, it's cationic, so we can just write platinum, right? Platinum and the oxidation state, Roman numeral four. And in this case, the counter ion is sulfate, so we just write sulfate. So we can say this mouthful. We have diaqua, oxalato, platinum four, sulfate. And there you go. Now let's look at this monster. Okay, so here we have an anionic. Remember, um, ammonium is a plus one, right? And so what is the charge on that whole thing? Well, it's simply equal minus one because they have to equal each other out. So let's look at this. We've got, oh, there's cyanide or cyano, right? So that's three times negative one, right? So that's negative three. Amines neutral. Ooh, this is one of our ambidentate ligands. So this one's actually bound. See this little underline? I use this as a term, as just a um, notation to let you know what's actually bound to the metal. So in this case, the, the thiocyanate is bound to the end, so it becomes isothiocyanate. And so either way, it's a negative one charge. And so here we see we have what? Negative three plus negative one is negative four. The whole thing has to be negative one, so that means this iron is going to be a positive three. There we go. So let's take a look. Um, we've got, what do we got here? We've got, oh my goodness, we've got the amine ligand, right? And we've got two M's there for amine. And we got two of these. Um, so we'll put dye on there in a minute. Um, for all, when we have a bunch of different ligands, I like to just 
make sure we put them in order first. So cyano, and then we've got, oh, this is gonna be a iso, thio, cyanato, right? So there are three ligands, the iso, thio, cyanato is indicating that it's bound through the nitrogen. Uh, we only have one of those, so you don't need a, a prefix. We have three uh, cyano, so we put tri, we have two amines, so we put di, so we say diamine, tricyano, isothiocyanato. Um, this is an anionic complex, so we call this uh, ferrate, right? Ferrate, and the oxidation state is a three. And we're done with that, so now we have to write the counter ion. Don't forget the counter ion. So we say this is ammonium. So ammonium, diamine, tricyano, isothiocyanato, ferrate three. That is a mouthful. That's why you would definitely, if you were to discover something like this, you would call it something really simple uh, as a common name. But yeah, that's that's how you name it. That's You just have to be systematic. And I don't care how scary it looks, if you use these simple rules I gave you, you can do it. It's not, not that big of a deal. Okay, two more and we're all done. All right, this one here, we've got, ooh, a phosphate, right? A phosphate is a three minus. So that means this whole complex, therefore, has to be a cationic three plus. Ethylene diamine, that is a neutral ligand. Carbonyl is a neutral ligand, which means that that iridium is going to be a three plus. So let's go ahead and name it. Um, this one's going to be a little bit different for you, I think. So let's, let's I, I like throwing these in that, that kind of, throw you a curveball. It's always better to have hard problems and homework or examples before you get to the exam. At least at least I hope you think so. All right, so carbonyl, right? So carbonyl is the name of carbon monoxide when it becomes a ligand. And then we have ethylene diamine. Oh, I know this is ethylene diamine. And in this case, diamine has one M. Now, here's why I use the parentheticals, because for bidentate or polydentate ligands, we have to use those alternate prefixes, the bis, tris, tetricus, three, uh, two, three, four. So in this case, we're gonna call it bis ethylene diamine, because again, it's got a prefix in its name. You don't wanna call it diethylene diamine. That's just, it doesn't work out. So we use that alternate prefix. So this is bis ethylene diamine. You would use that for oxalato, which is another polydentate, or glycinato, or anything else that's a multidentate or polydentate ligand. Uh, for carbonyl, that is a monodentate ligand. So here's where you use your traditional di, tri, you know, uh, typical uh, Greek prefixes. So dicarbonyl, bis ethylene diamine, and you're just gonna, since it's a cation, you're just gonna call it iridium and the oxidation state was a three. And then since the counter ion is over here, you're gonna put that as phosphate. So dicarbonyl, bis ethylene diamine, iridium three phosphate. And the last one is really quite simple. The only ligand here is ethylene diamine. So if you think about this, you have chloride, chloride is your counter ion, so that's three times negative one. That means this complex has to be a three plus. The only way, since ethylene diamine is neutral, that you get three plus is from the cobalt being a three plus. So you can just say, if you have three of these ethylene diamines, you're gonna use the alternate prefix. So you're gonna say tris ethylene diamine. And it's gonna be cobalt. And the oxidation state was three. It's a cationic complex, so you don't have to worry about the weird endings. And then you just put the counter ion. Chloride, boom. So tris, ethylene, diamine, cobalt, three, chloride. This is actually historically a very famous uh, coordination compound, very famous complex uh, that Alfred Werner uh, did a lot of work with back in the day. Uh, we'll talk about uh, one of the reasons it's so special is because it's actually chiral, uh, which uh, we'll talk about next time. But anyway, I hope um, this has helped you um, gain a little clarification on the naming. Um, I apologize, my pen is kind of acting up on me, so I'm probably gonna have to do an upgrade on that. But I'll, I'll keep working on these as long as they are useful to you. And um, if you have questions, uh, email me, throw them in the comments, or better yet, just talk to me in class. So um, take care, and I'll see you soon.